Good evening, everyone. Welcome to part two of the Tocqueville Center's September event. My name is Brent Nelson, and I am the interim director of the Tocqueville Center for the Study of Democracy and Society, and a professor in the Department of Politics and International Affairs. The Tocqueville Center is dedicated to exploring the big questions asked by the best minds in the Western tradition. Alexis de Tocqueville, the 19th century French aristocrat, social scientist, philosopher, and politician, is one of those great minds. His classic book, Democracy in America, is still a must read for all students of politics, especially students of democracy. This year, the Tocqueville Center is honoring the legacy of its namesake by focusing on topics in which Tocqueville was particularly interested in. This month, we are examining Protestant religion in America. If you would like to see other topics we're exploring this fall, please pick up a brochure from one of our ushers somewhere around here. They're running around. Oh, there's Vivian. She's got a number. And they were out on the table. Um, and uh, so, yeah, pick up one of, uh, of those brochures. And uh, the spring schedule has also been announced, and a brochure will be published later this term. We will be welcoming to campus such luminaries as Robert Putnam, David Brooks, Philip Gorski, Helen Andrews, and Patrick Deneen. You will not want to miss this spring's program. Last night, we began our examination of America's Protestant landscape by hearing from Molly Worthen on the increasing importance of Pentecostal and charismatic belief and practice in the US and abroad, and Emma Green on the struggles of Protestants to live together in a country buffeted by cultural conflicts. Tonight, we'll hear from our two remaining speakers, Ryan Burge and Eric McDaniel before getting the whole gang back up here on stage for a panel discussion that will include questions from the audience. But before I introduce the speakers for the evening, let me first read Furman's Standards of Comportment, which we are required to read before each CLP. This event is part of the university's cultural life program, which provides opportunities for students to participate in a variety of educational and enriching cultural experiences. Through these events, students encounter a spectrum of issues, ideas, opinions, and artistic expressions from various disciplines and cultures. CLPs invite meaningful dialogue, leading to a healthy understanding of and respect for differences. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of the university. All participants are expected to display respect for the presenters, performers, and audience members. Keep an open mind in the presence of new ideas and opinions and conduct themselves with civility. In turn, all presenters are also expected to encourage productive and responsible conversation consistent with the mission and values of the university. And please turn off your phones if you haven't already done so. Now to our guests. Ryan Burge is Associate Professor of Political Science at Eastern Illinois University. He earned a BA from Greenville College and an MA and PhD from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. He is the author or co-author of four books, including The Nuns, Where They Came From, Who They Are, and Where They Are Going, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America, and his most recent book, The Great De-Churching, Who's Leaving, why are they going, and what will, what will it take to bring them back? He appeared in an NBC documentary on Full Frontal with Samantha B, and on 60 Minutes. He is also the research director for Faith Counts, a nonprofit interfaith organization that promotes the value of religion to the American public. And Dr. Burge is, in addition, pastor of an American Baptist church where he has served for over 17 years. Our second speaker is Eric McDaniel. He is Associate Professor of Government and the Co-Director of the Politics of Race and Ethnicity Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. He earned his BA at Wilberforce University and his MA and PhD at the University of Illinois. 
His research examines how the intersection of race and religion influence the American political landscape. His books include Politics in the Pews, The Political Mobilization of Black Churches, and most recently, The Everyday Crusade, Christian Nationalism in American Politics. Currently, he is working on projects examining religious belief systems, religious freedom, and the role of religion in shaping health behavior. We will have uh, talks from both of those gentlemen in succession, and then we will uh, have the panel discussion. So, will you join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Burge? Well, thank you all for having all of us. It's been a wonderful 24 hours we've had. Uh, I am going to present to you something that I've seen in the data that I think might be the most important development in not just Protestant religion, but just religion in general in America, um, which is the idea that religion has become a luxury good. What I mean by that is religion has has become something that the people who are doing everything in life right are gravitating towards and the people who do anything wrong are being pushed away from. And I think it has tremendous implications, not just for American religion, but American society and American democracy. These are not small questions that only concern pastors and priests, but should concern all of us as citizens in the United States. So... When we think about religion, we think about pictures like this, right? Whenever I talk about religion, especially with my students, it seems like the first thing they think of is, is snake handlers and, and people who are, you know, writhing on the floor. They don't think of just the average Methodist who goes to church wearing a suit and tie and singing hymns and going home. They're almost drawn to the spectacular, the, the, the inexplicable, the the outer edge of what religion is. You see pictures of churches in Appalachia that look like this. You see people make statements like this. Religion is how simple, uneducated people cope with a world they can't understand. That is, I'm, I'm, I, I write on, on, on this website called, it used to be called Twitter, now it's called something else. And this is the feedback that I get oftentimes, is this understanding of religion, that it's almost like a, a relic of a bygone era. It's a superstition. It's, it's something that we should have gotten rid of with the Enlightenment, that it really doesn't belong in polite American society. Um, the, the phrase that makes me want to jump off a cliff is when they refer to God as Sky Daddy. Like, how... Den and I, I get this, by the way. Probably once a week, someone will come on my Twitter and go, I don't need Sky Daddy to make me feel better. That is the understanding that especially people who are incredibly online have about religion, that religion is unsophisticated, it's for poor people, it's for uneducated, um, non-thoughtful people about how to get through life, it's for the underclass, it's for those looking for a coping mechanism, it's for those who are looking for hope amongst hopeless people. Maybe Karl Marx comes to mind right now, right? It's the opium of the masses. That's what Marx thought religion was. It was a tool to control people and keep them down and keep people happy in their poverty. There's a reason why they taught spirituals to slaves in the South, right? Slaves, obey your masters as to the Lord and not unto men. That slavery was a God-ordained institution and don't resist that. It was really put on display in this book. Anybody read this book that came out in 2004 called What's the Matter with Kansas by Thomas Frank? So I went to grad school in 2005. This book was published a year before I started my Ph.D. program focusing on religion and politics. And when I say it consumed the discourse in our field for two or three years, I am not exaggerating. Thomas Frank is a reporter who grew up in Kansas, left, and then comes back to a planet that he does not understand going back to visit his family. Kansas used to be one of, the, if not the most liberal state in America. Eugene Debs was based in Kansas, wrote his newspaper with 100,000 subscribers from Kansas. <laughs> used to be one of those left-leaning states, and he comes back, Thomas Frank comes back and visits his family, and now all it is is full of Republican religious right conservatives. And Frank's argument is that 
basically the Republican Party has duped a lot of poor Kansans to vote for them so they will end abortion and gay marriage when, when they really want to just lower taxes on rich people. So the stupid people living in Kansas, the religious idiots, don't understand what the Republican Party is doing to you. That's his entire argument. He said that many times. Thomas Frank was wrong, by the way. If you look at the data, there's actually a paper written called What's the Matter with What's the Matter with Kansas, written by Larry Bartels, and basically he shows you that everything in that book does not comport with what the data tells us. Here's what the data tells us. This is the relationship between education and whether someone identifies as an atheist, agnostic, or they have no religion in particular. Okay? This is in every wave of the cooperative election study going back to 2008. The average sample size in these waves is somewhere around 40,000 people. This is not a small sample. Okay? You notice what, what trend line the lines are going in every single time? The group that is the most likely to identify as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular are those without a high school diploma, and the group that's the least likely to identify as a religious nun are those with a graduate degree. Yes. Yes. The people who are the most likely to identify as Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Mormon, Buddhist, Orthodox are those with graduate degrees. The least likely people are those without a high school diploma. Religious people tend to have higher levels of education than non-religious people. And this is a sample of 477,000 Americans. And what I love about this question is it gets even more granular because it asks you what kind of graduate degree you have. So this sample has 4,000 people with doctoral degrees in it despite the fact that we only make up 1% of the population. Like Bernie Sanders, 1%. Yes, the 1%. You notice anything? The people who are most likely to identify as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, are those without a high school diploma. The most likely people to be religious in the sample are those with a master's degree. Okay? Now, it goes up slightly for those with a doctoral degree to 24%, but that's still the same percentage of those with a bachelor's degree. 76% of people with doctoral degrees in America identify with a religious tradition. It's only 32% of those without a high school diploma say they're atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. Do you see a trend here? And this, this is religious attendance. So the question is, do you, how often do you attend religious services? The response options range from never to more than once a week. Again, all the waves of the cooperative election study. Again, looking at education. And what do we see? In every single year, the least likely people to attend religious services, not just church, by the way, any religious service at all, are those without a high school diploma. The people who are most likely to attend church every week in America are those with a postgraduate degree. And these are not small differences either. Okay, This is not 2%. For instance, in 2022, the difference goes between 18% and 30%. I mean, this is a significant difference, not just statistically, but substantively, a large difference in the not just religious belonging, but religious behavior of highly educated Americans. But, oh, this is a, for you stats folks, this is for you. This is an interaction model with a couple controls because people are like, oh, but if you control for age and blah, 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 it'll all wash out. Well, I took the GSS sample and divided it into decades, and this is the likelihood of attending religious services nearly every week. As you can see, the 1970s, the line goes up. The 1980s, the line goes up. The 1990s, the line goes up. The 2000s, the line goes up. Now, in the 2010s, it still goes up. Now, the pitch is smaller than it was, but it's still a positive relationship between these two variables, okay? There is absolutely no evidence that you can muster in quantitative data that says the more educated you are, the less likely you are to go to religious services. It's just not there. And the more likely, the higher level of education you have, the more likely you are to identify with a religious tradition. Let's go a step farther, though. Oh, by the way, same regression, different data set, lines still point upwards. This is the cooperative election study. Again, huge sample size. You can also see the overall level of attendance is going down, though, obviously, because that's what's happening in America. People are attending less. 
But the, these differences are not small ones. We're talking a 10% difference between people at the bottom end versus people at the top end of the educational spectrum. So let's add income to the mix now. This is the likelihood of attending religious services every week by education and income level. So college degree are in the orange, high school or less are in the blue. You notice in almost every one of these situations, the college degree people are more likely to attend than those with a high school degree or less. But notice, for instance, like in 2020 and 2022, you see what that's income across the x-axis. You notice what those lines look like? Curvilinear, high in the middle and low on the sides, which means the least likely people to go are those with very low incomes or very high incomes, the people that are most likely to go are people in the middle of the income spectrum, okay? So the people that are most likely to be in a church, synagogue, or mosque this weekend will, people, will, will be people with a four-year college degree who make between sixty dollars and $100,000 per year. Middle class, maybe even upper middle class, depending on where your cost of living is. It's not poor people. It's not super rich people. It's people, two-parent household, we'll get to the parent households in a thing, but people who have middle-class jobs, white-collar jobs, making middle-class incomes. Think of school teachers. Think of insurance agents, right? Think of lawyers. Those are the kind of people who are the most likely to be in a religious service this weekend. Let's add marital status to it. This is age across the X, likelihood of attending religious services every week across the Y, Look at that blue line compared to that yellow line and that, and that red line. That blue line to people who are married. A 30-year-old who is married is more than twice as likely to attend religious services than someone who is divorced or has never been married. Twice as likely. And that gap basically maintains by at least 10 or 12 points across the entire life course. If you are married, you are much more likely to be in religious service than if you're not married. Let's add kids to the mix. If you're married with children, no one goes to church more than people who are married. Now look, the blue line does go up. These are people who are married but then not a parent. But then as those people get older and are married but don't have kids, look what happens to their weekly attendance. It drops off. The people who are the most likely, let's put this all in perspective, the people who are the most likely to be in church this weekend, four-year college degree, make between sixty dollars and $100,000 a year, married with children. That's the combination. Some economists would call that the golden path. If you check all those boxes, have a college degree, get married and have children, you are significantly more likely to have a middle-class income than if you don't. You're also significantly more likely to go to religious services than those who don't check all those boxes. American religion has become a place where everybody, for people who do everything right, quote unquote. And that's a real problem for a bunch of reasons. I'm a pastor, so I care about these things from a pastoral perspective, right? When Jesus preached, he preached to people on the margins of society. If you read the Gospel of Luke, it says the last shall be first and the first shall be last all the time. Jesus is constantly worried about the people who are not there, who don't show up. So pastorally, this bothers me quite a bit. But also, as a social scientist and the one who worries about democracy every day, I'm also worried as well. So this is a question from the General Social Survey, and it asks the, the way it's phrased is really simple. All it says is, generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you can't be too careful in dealing with people? They've asked the question the same way from the very beginning in the 1970s. This is the share of people who say that people can generally be trusted. Notice the pitch of the line in the 1970s. This is religious attendance on the x-axis. Notice the pitch of the line in all those. It's going slightly upward, which means the more you go to church, the more likely you are to trust your fellow man. But you see what happened in the last 10 years? that line now turns downward just slightly. Now, the more you go to church, the less trusting you are of your fellow man. That's a problem. And if you put that in a regression analysis, which is what this is right here, you can see it as well. So that's 1970 across the top, 1980 across the top, 1990 in the green, 
and the pink is 2000s, but look what happens in the 2010s. Now, the more you go to church, the less likely you are to say that other people can generally be trusted. Why is that? Well, I think the first thing I showed you relates to the second thing I showed you, which is if you go to church with people who all look like you, and think like you, and vote like you, you don't know anyone who's not like you. And if you don't know them, you don't trust them. If you look back at American history, what you see is the church used to be one of the spots in America where people from different classes hung out with each other, right? In the 1980s, if you sat in a pew in an evangelical church in the 1980s, you were just as likely to sit next to a Republican as you were a Democrat. You sat in a mainline church, Republicans and Democrats were 50-50. You sat in a Catholic church, it was 50-50. It's not that way anymore. Even in a lot of mainline churches, they're sorting out the other direction. They're becoming almost all liberal, all left-leaning. And now what we're creating is these monocultures inside of churches where it's all people who are the exact same. And it's really easy to not like someone and not trust someone if you don't know that person. There's this great theory in social science called social contact theory. It says if you know someone from an outgroup, you become more tolerant of that outgroup. We see it all the time when it comes to issues like LGBTQ and Muslims, for, example, for instance. If you know someone personally who's a Muslim, you are much more tolerant of Muslims as an idea because you personify them as an individual, not a group. But imagine if all the circles you run in are all the same people. And that's what American religion has become especially amongst Protestant Christians. It's become people who have done everything right and nothing wrong, and I think that's a problem. I'll finish with a story. You guys, have you ever been to a liturgical church? You guys know what I'm talking about here where you like have the lectionary and you do certain things the same way every time? You guys ever done this thing called prayers of the people? It's this really cool like interactive thing where the, the, the pastoral priest will will come up there and he'll say, um, he'll have a little written prayer, like pray for the country and pray for this, that, and the other thing that's going on. And then he'll open it up for the congregation. And you kind of respond with a, a simple one or two sentence prayer, like, my, you know, my sister Kathy has cancer. Could you all pray for her? And the, con- the pastor will say, Lord, in your mercy, and the congregation will respond with, hear our prayer, right? And this usually goes on for two minutes. Not a big deal. You get like, oh, my grandma's sick, or we're traveling, or, you know, something minor. I was at a church in Greenville, in undergrad. It was a teaching church where we did prayers to the people. And near, right after the service started, a young couple walked in who were younger than me at the time. When I was 22. A young man, and it looked like his wife or girlfriend, she had a baby on her hip. During prayers to the people, pray for Aunt Kathy, pray for my kid, pray for this, normal stuff. And right before it was over, this young man pipes up in the back and says, could you all pray for me? I lost my job, and I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent this month. Pastor says, Lord, in your mercy, and we all say, hear our prayer, close that part of the service, and move on to the next part of the service. Well, hear the homily, do the communion, service is over. I see one of the older businessmen in the congregation take a beeline to that young man when the service ended and said, son, if you can want a job, you can come work at my lumber yard tomorrow. The Lord works in mysterious ways. I think we forget sometimes the this value of religion. You can pray all you want to get a job, but if you speak a need into a community of people who are inclined to help you, they are going to help you. And if churches are seen more and more as a place for people who do everything right, I wonder if the rungs of economic mobility that churches used to provide are being cut every single day. And I think we are worse as a religious culture, as a democratic culture, and as an American culture, by religion becoming a luxury good. Thank you. Quick change. Find the cursor. Dr. McDaniel. Maybe somebody's bottle of water later, but uh, just in case I get dry mouth, let me do save myself. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me out. This is actually my first time in the Palmetto State, and 
first of all, this is a beautiful campus. Uh, I am uh, in awe of the beauty. Um, like I've seen North Carolina, and uh, now that I've seen South Carolina, I'm like, oh, this is, this is really nice. And I am excited to be here. I'm excited to meet the faculty, meet the students. Uh, we went to the, what was it, the trap door last night. Uh, so those of you who've been there, uh, I remember I mentioned to somebody, like, ooh. So I was like, yeah, it was really good. I'm not sure where we're going tonight, but um, I'm glad to be back in the real South. I'm in Austin now. And they say, oh, no, we're Southern. I'm like, oh, no. no. Uh, Austin also claims to have the best breakfast tacos. And like, I think like San Antonio was ready to invade the city over that. Um, I was like, look, you, you've capitalized on hipsters and, uh, and technology. Other than that, just stay out of the way of the, of the real South. Uh, another reason why it's kind of exciting to be here um, in South Carolina talking about this is really the history of the black church. And I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about the history of the black church and kind of where the, the black church is going, highlight some of the research that I've been doing as well as some of the research that others have been doing um, in, in, in this regard. And specifically understanding the history of the black church, but also how this links to black politics in particular. And to start off with uh, understanding of of black politics. We're going to start off, one, with understanding the essence of black politics, because politics has played a very key role in shaping the black church. So Haynes Walton and Robert C. Smith, in their uh, book, The uh, African American Politics and the Quest for Universal Freedom, which is, uh, which is a textbook, but I think it's a kind of a classic in understanding the nature of black politics, they argue that black politics, or the essence of black politics, it encompasses natural rights, civil rights, and social rights. Specifically, it's about freedoms inherent in one's humanity, equality of treatment under the law, and the right to choose personal and business associates. And one of the things we'll see when we talk about the black church and the nature of the black church is that these three things are all within us. Now, when trying to understand the uh, black church, it's, the importance of the black church is extremely important because it itself is a political institution. The black church is black owned, black maintained, black operated. It is seen as a kind of purely black institution. And because of this, it does carry political weight. And I'll give you two examples of why. If you look at the Swedish uh, sociologist Gunnar Myrdal uh, in his book, The um, American Dilemma, he states, the chief function of the Negro church has been to buoy the hopes of its members in the face of adversity and to give them a sense of community. If we look at W.B. Du Bois, that the black church demands respect as the first demonstrator of the ability of the civilized Negro to govern himself. So what you have coming from this is that this is an institution that is its mere existence is critical to the livelihood of the group. And if we think about our early churches, so we have uh, Silver Bluff uh, in, South, in South Carolina, which is kind of seen as one of the first independent black churches. But, you know, South Carolina has played a very big role in shaping this. Now, what you also see coming out of the discussion of the black church is a unique type of Christianity and a unique type of Protestantism. And if you look at the classic work of Lincoln and Mamiya in the book, The Black Church in the African American Experience, where they provide, as best I can see, a, a large overview of churches, how they operate. Uh, now, again, this book is 30, is, ooh, this book came out in, 90, in 1990. Uh, so it's not a new, it's not a very young book, but no other massive undertaking has been done uh, regarding the black church. But it does provide us with something important. And what they argue when talking about the black sacred cosmos is that it is a religious worldview within the context of the African American experience. One of the things that they highlight, and you see a lot of others, a lot of other scholars and theologians highlight, is that religion has to explain your world. That, the, that your religious worldview is in many ways a reflection of your world, of what you're experiencing. And if your religion cannot explain your world, your religion is useless. And so you see that there's a stressing of certain aspects of the faith, 
a God that is personally involved in human affairs. So not a God that is distant, but a God that is up close and personal, a God that is constantly watching. So a God that is actively saving you and a God that is actively punishing you. Uh, but then also that religious salvation and freedom, in this case physical freedom, are combined aspects. That the process of emancipation is not just a physical aspect, but a spiritual aspect as well. And from this, what you get is a distinctive nature of the religious belief system, but then also religious belief practices. And so we kind of, we have the images of black churches being very lively, ceremonies, things like that, where you'll see this not just in Protestant congregations, but also Catholic congregations. But also what you'll see in Protestant as well as Catholic is this emphasis on the idea of freedom, the idea of equality, the idea of respecting black dignity. And this institution has played this key role. And we can see the black, we can see the black sacred cosmos take shape in the early years of the nation uh, through several individuals. And so Nathaniel Paul, an abolitionist, uh, made this statement regarding, uh, regarding slavery. And so he stated, uh, did I believe uh, that I would always continue and that man uh, to the end of time would be permitted with impunity to usurp the same undue authority over his fellow? I, I would disallow any allegiance or obligation to the laws of my country. I de would deny the superintending power of divine providence in the affairs of this life. I would ridicule the religion of the savior of the world and treat the worst of men, the ministers of the everlasting gospel. I would consider my Bible as a book of false and delusive fables, and I would uh, at once confess myself an atheist and deny the existence of a holy God. What you see coming out of this is the black secret cosmos in action, the, the idea that where, slave, where blacks and slaves are being taught that slavery was God intended, that this is the way God wanted it, but this is a clear rejection of this, that God wanted us to be free. And... The black religious experience is critical in this because it is a way of invoking the idea of black humanity, but not just humanity, but also the spirituality. That, that within this individual is a spirit that should be re respected and a body that should be respected as well. Uh, if you look at Frederick Douglass and his critique of slavery and slaveholding religion, he said, what I've respected and uh, what, I, what I have respecting and against religion, I mean strictly apply to slaveholding religion of this land. And with no possible reference to Christianity proper, for between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that, that to receive one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. And as he goes on, I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, slave women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. So this is an outright rebuke of the slaveholding Christianity of the South, of rejection of the those who... Uh, appeal to the sla of slaveholding Christianity in a variety of ways. And one of the things that's important to note about this is that blacks, there was a bit of consternation about the conversion of blacks. So one of the early justifications for why you could enslave Africans is, well, they weren't Christians, they weren't Protestants. Then you ran into a problem. Well, if we enslave them because they're not converted, but I guess we need to convert them. But if we convert them, then they're Protestants which means they're civilized, they can't be enslaved. So they ran into a bit of a hiccup there. Well, to get around that, several states passed laws saying that conversion of slaves did not, equate, uh, did not mean that they were free. So that's how they got around that, that little hiccup. But you also had stories justifying kind of a racial hierarchy. You have the curse of Ham, uh, you have the curse of Cain. Uh, so the idea that Cain was given a mark after he slew Abel. The black response to that is that what happened is when Cain slew Abel and he heard God's voice, he was so scared that his hair stood straight up on end and he went pale as a ghost. And that's how you got your first white person. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, not another another story is a story of there's a white kid and a black kid kind of going for a walk somewhere. The white kid uh, tells the black kid, you know, I learned God loved me more because he made me white. The black kid responds like, oh, I learned God loved me more because he took the time to color me in. But this is this idea of religion being reaffirmed uh, to, uh, uh, to black people and the idea of respecting the humanity of, of, of African Americans. Now, when we talk about the black sacred cosmos, there is evidence of this when we look at this politically. Uh, I'm not sure why the colors are this way, but if you look at the, uh, I guess, what is that, pink? Uh, pink and purple, or maybe fuchsia. I, I, I always get them mixed up. I went to public school, I apologize. Uh, but if you look at which part is more concerned with protecting religious values, and with the GOP being one, and this is really the predicted uh, probability, what you find is that as whites increase their religious conservatism, there's really no movement. But for blacks, there's a decrease. They're less likely to say it's the GOP. Uh, here, which is a little bit easier to read, conservative Christians have gone too far in trying to impose religious values on the country. Uh, if you look at uh, whites, you see that there's a decrease. Um, and for blacks, there's a bit of a decrease, but nowhere near as steep. And so there's something going on here uh, related to this. And the idea that blacks who are just as religious as whites, are not, it's not translating into the same politics. And so there's a lot of evidence supporting uh, with the idea of the black sacred cosmos. And so uh, some of the work I've done with Christopher Ellison, looking at partisanship in the state of Texas, where we can find that uh, those the religious conservatives, the white religious conservatives over uh, about a 20-year period moved into the GOP, whereas uh, blacks moved out of the GOP and into, uh, and into the Democratic Party. And you see a, a bit of an uptick for, uh, uh, for Hispanics, but nowhere near at the same rate as, as whites. You have the work of Brian McKenzie and Stella Rouse, who highlight that if you look at the way in which religion works, for, or if you look at the interaction of, of specific aspects of religious conservatism along racial lines, that it behaves differently. That, in fact, race moderates the effect of religion on certain issues. Where you find that as blacks become more religiously conservative on certain issues, they become more liberal on other issues. Uh, more recently, you have uh, Tasha Philpott's book, Conservative But Not Republican, where she highlights that religious conservatism on the part of, for whites leads to uh, conservatism regarding social welfare, things of that nature. But for blacks, it's the exact opposite that blacks has become more religiously conservative, become much more supportive of, uh, become much more liberal on race issues, but also on social welfare issues. And so there's something, the, the, the issue is there's something going on with the black understanding of the same text is leading to different, uh, leading to different outcomes. Now with that said about the, the, the nature of the, of the black sacred cosmos and the distinctiveness of that, in relation to how blacks think about politics, one thing we need to understand is the black church is not, is not unidimensional. There's a lot of variation within the black church. There are a lot of people who argue we shouldn't even say there's a black church. Uh, I'll, I'll say maybe black religious tradition, uh, something along those lines, but it's the idea of saying there really is no like one core institution. It's more a collection uh, that, we see at, that we see as one. But Lincoln and Mia talk about that. And they talk about the dialectical nature of the black church and the sense that churches are constantly being pulled in different directions. So being priestly versus being prophetic. So am I there to talk about, you know, the, the scripture, things like that, or, or what do we am out there to kind of challenge what's going on in the world? Otherworldly versus thisworldly. And so the black church has often been criticized for being uh, otherworldly. The idea of you, you will receive your reward when you get to heaven. And this is the critique of the slaveholding church. Uh, so when I mentioned Silver Bluff uh, in, in South Carolina, one of the first independent black churches, it was founded by George Leal, uh, a former slave. And he was freed because of his ability to convince slaves that, no, no, this is the right thing to do, that slavery is good for him. So he was freed because of his ability to pacify slaves, or, you know, as um, Ron kind of pointed out, the idea of religion as an opiate. Uh, you also, universalism versus particularism. When are we concerned about everybody? When are we concerned about our people? Communal versus privatistic. 
So again, this idea of the uh, spreading and making sure everybody is involved, or when do we just leave it to our, our people? Charismatic versus bureaucrat. So when are we supposed to be there to get people excited um, and really kind of touch them emotionally, and then when are we supposed to make just hardline decisions about really paperwork, financial things, things like that? But also resistance versus accommodation. Historically, we have envisioned the black church as being a source of resistance. So we think of the civil rights movement. Uh, we can think of the abolitionists. Uh, so if we think of some of the biggest slave revolts that happened in the U.S., so Gabriel Prosser within the church, uh, Denmark Vesey, so in, in Columbia, South, in, uh, in South Carolina, 200 years ago, that, was, that plot was developed in his church, Nat Turner. Now, we think of the church as a source of resistance. However, it has also been a place for accommodation. So I gave you the example of George Leal before. But one of the things that King had to fight during the Civil Rights Movement is getting other black clergy on board. So the pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church before him tried to start a bus boycott. And it was on the bus with members of his, church, members of his congregation sitting there looking at him, and they just sat there. So Vernon Johns was trying to get something movement, and they just sat there and looked at him. King was uh, reviled by many, black, by, by many black clergy. They saw him as a troublemaker. And so this idea of the black church being there for resistance is that it is seen as being relatively more resistant, but the baseline has been accommodation. And when I... What worked on my first book, trying to understand why churches choose to be political, some churches choose not to be. What you find is most choose not to be. And because they're just trying to survive. They're trying to make it day to day. The idea of resistance is something that comes about. And the issue is that the black church is more likely to engage in resistance, but its modal form is going to be accommodation. And so from this, there's been a great deal of critique from a variety of individuals. So we talk about Du Bois praising the black church. He's also criticized the black church. And so because of this, the black church is a, is a complex institution. There are a lot of things going on. There's a lot of movement going on. And so because of that, its way of involving itself in, in black politics and American politics varies. And so one of the things that I've been focusing on lately is this idea of religious worldviews. And when I talk about religious worldviews, it's that I want to move beyond kind of looking at, at the issue of practices, looking at traditions, but looking really more at beliefs. And not just you, what you believe about the Bible, but what you believe your religion calls you to do. And so the first one I kind of picked up on was the idea of the social gospel, because that's what's seen as critical for understanding the black church, the black church being a good example of the social gospel, or, or a shining example of it. So here I have pictured... Uh, some of the individuals that would be most likely to be associated with it. Um, so uh, Jim Wallace, uh, Reverend William Barber III, uh, examples like that. Uh, the social gospel is an argument that every Christian uh, has a religious obligation to both herself and society as a whole. Furthermore, res the resurrection story is about overcoming oppression. And finally, emphasizes actively working to help marginalized and confronting institutions that bring about inequalities. So this is the classic social gospel argument. You can think about this in terms of the, the work of King. You can think about this in uh, terms of a variety of what we think of as the traditional black church. But there's another religious worldview that exists. And there are multiple out there, but there's a second one that, um, that I focus on, and that is the prosperity gospel. And so the prosperity gospel emphasizes the idea that God will help the faithful with financial and physical prosperity. Uh, so if we think about some of the things that Molly highlighted yesterday with the kind of growth of Pentecostalism, this idea that you can take control of your world through your faith, this is something you see coming out of the prosperity gospel. Uh, that the resurrection story is about the ability to, to attain perfect health and flourish financially, and finally, stresses the need to remain committed to traditional ideals and practices in order for people to experience the good life, which can be defined by material possessions, health, or social relationships. So one example I can give you of this, and this is a bit clumsy on the part of the pastor, 
It said, you know, if you tithe, that job you've been looking for, you'll get that. Uh, that mate you want, that relationship you want, it'll come about. And your credit score will increase. It was a bit clumsy, but this idea that being, showing this commitment, there will be a, a, a reward. Now, both of these have been criticized heavily. So the social gospel has been criticized by numerous. You see it as naive. You can think of um, Niebuhr's complaints about the social gospel. Where early on, he could be seen as someone who uh, held on to the social gospel. But as time went on, it was like, no, this is just way too naive. There is actual you know, individual evil, and just changing structures won't save it. The prosperity gospel has been criticized for treating God as an ATM, and has been seen as a way of duping individuals. Uh, and so if you think about the way it's, it's been articulated and the way it's been treated, that it has received a great deal of, uh, of anger. And in fact, you've had a congressional um, a, a Senate hearing over these, over these ministers. And so uh, Joel Olstein has created, has received a great deal of, of, of anger towards him, Joyce Meyer, Creflo Dollar, if you remember about um, five, six years ago, he wanted... I think money for a, I think it was like 30 million or it may have been more for a private jet. Because you need a private jet to go back and forth. That got a lot of attention. Uh, now, one thing that's important to note about Creflo Dollar is that he now argues that you don't have to tithe. That his argument for tithing was a misinterpretation of the Bible. I'm not really sure what that means going forward, uh, what's going on, uh, but he's kind of pushed back on that, but he's still very high on the prosperity gospel you're thinking about. If you're thinking about the uh, prosperity gospel and social gospel in relation to uh, politics, through the social gospel, you hear, see pictured here that members, uh, bishops of the African Methodist Episcopal Church are laying hands and praying for President Obama. Uh, if you look at this picture of President Trump, you have a variety of well-known uh, clergy who are associated with the prosperity gospel praying for him. So you can see this kind of tension uh, going on. Where, 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 um, in terms of where they're going in terms of their politics. So what does this mean for American political behavior? Well, if we just start, look at American political behavior, and then I'll move it to black political behavior. Uh, one of the first things, so I try to develop a measure of these two to, try to, to take a look at. One of the things that's interesting is that if you look at, at this, you see the prosperity gospel is associated with more conservative beliefs, more likely to identify as a Republican, and the social gospel moves in the other direction. Uh, if you look at who adheres to these belief systems, uh, what you find is uh, there are a lot of arguments. So some argue that it's, it's something there for the wealthy to feel justified in what they have. Others feel, say, no, it's something for the poor to have some type of aspiration. And what I found is that, well, there's evidence for both, but it's conditioned by race. That for whites, there is a positive relationship between income and adherence to the prosperity gospel for blacks, it is a negative relationship. Furthermore, as blacks become wealthier, they are more likely to adhere to the social gospel. And so what you have here are the groups are treating this a little bit differently. So it seems to be for whites, it's an idea for, it could be seen as a way of justifying their income. For blacks, the prosperity gospel is a way of aspiration of what they can become. And then as blacks get wealthier, they realize, no, this wealth needs to be shared. It needs to go to others. Um, other work that I've done focusing on the social gospel has found that the social gospel is associated with greater support for um, health care reform, so for Obamacare and expanding uh, medical care. Um, and so one of the things that Obama did a lot when trying to advance this is he used a lot of religious rhetoric. So uh, I remember listening to a phone call that he was having with a religious group, and he used a lot of religious language, you know, that, uh, that there are kind of he didn't say false prophet. I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. But there was this emphasis on this. And you saw a lot of that rhetoric, the idea this is the thing to do. Uh, and you are seeing a lot of people, especially on the left, begin to invoke religious rhetoric. You can think of uh, President Biden doing that. But one of the things that's been pointed out is that President Obama used religious rhetoric much more than President Bush. And this was uh, kind of a, a key thing there. In many ways, he was the political poster boy for the social gospel. Um, but if we move this into understanding black politics, there's been a lot of work about this within black politics and a lot of discussion of this. 
Now, much of this work has been kind of, um, it's been focused on what do we think it means. It's been con kind of commentary, not a lot of data behind it, but there have been a, a lot of discussions about the social and prosperity gospel. So you think of Anthony Penn's book, uh, The Black Church, the Post-Civil Rights, um, in the post-Civil Rights era. He devotes his last chapter to about talking about the prosperity gospel and how this is a threat to the tradition of the black church. Uh, Melissa Harris uh, Lacewell talks about this as well, We're kind of juxtaposing the, um, the idea of from liberation to mutual fund of the social gospel and the prosperity gospel. But the black church has moved away from the social gospel tradition by allowing the, the prosperity gospel to come in and, and take over, which is leading the church astray, which will then lead black politics astray. Uh, Stephanie Mitchum, who's a professor at the uh, University of South Carolina, has set, made the same argument in her book, Name It and Claim It. And uh, then you also have uh, Fred Harris at Columbia making, this, making a similar argument regarding this. Most of the individuals who are looking at the prosperity gospel, at least in terms of what it means for black politics, see this as something bad. That it will undercut uh, the idea of group effectiveness, of being able to accomplish certain things. And the one I was really interested in is, okay, well, let's actually see if this is how this carries out. So I've done several studies looking at the prosperity gospel, uh, my measure of the prosperity gospel and this relationship with uh, black political attitudes. Uh, so one of my first pieces found that the prosperity gospel is associated with eroding certain aspects of black group consciousness. So group consciousness is, we often talk about group identity and the idea that you identify with a group. But group consciousness is something more. It's that not only do I identify with the group, but I link my success to the group's success, and I feel committed to acting on behalf of that group. And what we find is the social gospel is associated with, um, again, higher levels of group consciousness, but the prosperity gospel is associated with lower levels of group consciousness, specifically the idea of working together. The complaint about the, uh, one of the criticisms of the, of the prosperity gospel is that it's focused on a very individual level and fails to acknowledge the group, unlike the social gospel. One of the primary examples of this is Reverend Ike. I don't know how many of you remember Reverend Ike, but Reverend Ike in the 70s and 80s was kind of one of the first kind of black proponents of the prosperity gospel. And in talking about poverty, he said the best way to help the poor is not become one of them. And this is kind of, has kind of gone on in terms of how people talked about it and thought about it. Uh, some work I've done with uh, two uh, former graduate students looked at this in terms of you find that those who adhere to the prosperity gospel express more conservative beliefs uh, compared to those who adhere to the social gospel. Uh, but one thing we do find is that those who adhere to the prosperity gospel are much more supportive of black nationalism. This idea that blacks need to come together and form their own, their own community, which is a little bit different than what we found earlier. Um, but also that the prosperity gospel is, and, and the social gospel are both positive linked with black liberation theology. And black liberation theology was developed in the 70s by James Cone, 60s and 70s by James Cone. And it was, it couches itself as to truly be committed as a Christian, you have to understand the story of the oppressed. Jesus was oppressed, uh, and that, therefore, if you do not identify with the oppressed, you are not identifying with Jesus. And within the American context, if you do not identify with blacks, you are not identifying with Christ. And so um, this is uh, one of the things you see coming out of this. Um, I don't know why that's there twice, but maybe I liked it that much. Um, actually, it should not be there. A more recent piece with myself and my colleague, Tasha Philpott, demonstrated that those who adhere to the social gospel are more likely to be politically engaged, that blacks who adhere to the social gospel are likely to be politically engaged, um, whereas blacks who adhere to the prosperity gospel are less likely to be engaged. So what we have here is a concern about what does this mean in terms of the movement for, uh, for black politics, and might it actually um, be deleterious in terms of getting blacks out to vote, to protest, to take part in these things. So if you're thinking about the future of the black church, the future of black politics, is that the black church and black politics are, are intertwined. That the black church's existence is a political state. 
the black church's existence was come about because of the racial power. So if you think of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is very prominent in the state of South Carolina, it was created because blacks were mistreated in white churches. And that its, its existence is in many ways a, a clear statement against white supremacy. Because again, it's the idea of showing, no, we can do this. And so from this, you see universities. So for instance, I'm a graduate of Wilberforce University. You see the oldest private historically black college, which was built, which was um, developed by the AME Church, just such as, uh, same as Allen University here in South Carolina. Um, but the church still holds a role, critical role in black politics. You know, there is a reason why people are still attacking black churches. So you think of the Proud Boys, the Metropolitan AME in DC, you think of Dylan Roof with Mother Emanuel. That they still hold, they're still very symbolic as something uh, for black politics and unites black communities. However, we see that the social gospel st still needs to make itself relevant. That while we do see there are a lot of individuals who we could uh, associate with the social gospel, that there are some concerns about does it still resonate? Does the, uh, we think of King as being that example. It's very important to understand that King was despised by both, by both whites and blacks, and that many black clergy were opposed to him. This is why you see a break in the National Baptist Convention to see the creation of the Progressive National Baptist Convention, plus, and plus some other aspects. Uh, the prosperity gospel is something that is well entrenched within the black, within the black religious uh, sphere. And so, as Molly pointed out, that Pentecostalism has kind of taken over. You see the same thing going on with the black churches, where you'll hear social gospel and prosperity gospel messages kind of coming at the same time. And while many people have talked about the, 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 I guess the leaderist nature of the prosperity gospel, one of the things they need to acknowledge is the prosperity gospel is actually attached to many of the things we talked about uh, earlier when talking about the black sacred cosmos. The idea of a God that is actively involved. And so the prosperity gospel, though, there's a God that's actively involved that will actively reward, actively punish. God is there. God is watching. And this is the same God that was seen to deliver people out of slavery, to deliver people out of, um, out of segregation, out of the slums. And so Arguing that the prosperity gospel is purely antithetical to the black religious tradition is ignoring the, the multidimensional nature of the black religious tradition. And we need to understand how, especially for those who are high in the social gospel, how can we marry the two in such a way to be, find success going forward, but also for those who are trying to mobilize black voters, try to mobilize blacks for, um, for protest. How can these messages be used as a way to get them uh, to move forward to try to advance this search for universal freedom? Thank you. So Eric is going to take uh, a seat up here, and uh, we'd like to welcome the rest of the panelists um, to the stage along with Professor Jim Guth. Emma Green is just seated now next to Eric. Uh, she is an award-winning journalist and writer. She worked as, uh, as a staff writer for The Atlantic, where she covered religion and politics. She is now a staff writer for The New Yorker, where she covers cultural conflicts in academia. She is also a frequent contributor to the opinion pages of major news outlets. Ms. Green has won several awards for her writing, including Religion News Association's First Place Award in Religion News Analysis and the George W. Hunt S.J. Prize for Journalism. She graduated from Georgetown. And Molly Worthen, at the far end there, is Associate Professor of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she's a freelance journalist. She received her BA, MA, MPhil, and PhD from Yale University. Her research focuses on North American religious and intellectual history. Her most recent book is Apostles of Reason. Worthen writes regularly about religion, politics, and higher education for the New York Times and has also written for the New Yorker, Slate, The Atlantic, and other publications. Most of you know Jim Guth, who's going to He's right behind me. Um, let me just say, you know, we have a superstar 
scholar in our midst. Um, he was just awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award at the American Political Science Association for his path-breaking work in religion and American politics. He has published four books and 156 professional articles. So he is going to moderate tonight because he is also a, a contributor to this discussion. So I'll turn it over to Jim. I'd like to uh, start out by uh, asking our presenters, first of all, uh, a couple of questions, and then I want our uh, other participants to kind of uh, chime in with their own uh, questions and, and discussions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, you talked about some of the implications uh, of, for attitudes uh, of the uh, increasing uh, tendency of religious people to be highly educated and wealthy. Uh, what are some of the, uh, trust was one of the things you mentioned. Uh, are there other kinds of uh, attitudinal implications of, of that concentration that you see uh, and other potential political effects of the concentration of religion among the well-off and well-educated? Uh, and then let me just, uh, after you're done with that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Eric if he would give us um, his best estimate of the extent of the prosperity gospel in the black church. You know, I, uh, I know that that's a tough thing to get at, uh, but uh, is it increasing? Is it uh, half the black congregations uh, and so on? So I'll just throw those out and uh, after uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Ryan and maybe uh, talk about uh, that question for a while and uh, folks can chime in on that and then we'll move to the uh, second one. Yeah, so I think there's these really great survey questions where they ask people to place the Republican Party on a scale between one and seven, meaning one very liberal, seven very conservative. And they ask you to place the Democrats on a scale from one to seven. They ask you to place yourself on a scale from one to seven. What's really fascinating about white evangelicals specifically is they see the Democrats about as liberal as they get, and that's becoming more so over the last five to ten years. And I think largely that's because they don't know anyone who's a Democrat. Or they don't have regular conversations. They don't. It doesn't normalize the other party. So what? You, if some of my other favorite questions are, we ask Democrats what percentage of Republicans are evangelical or rich, and we ask Republicans what percentage of Democrats are atheists. Republicans think that one third of all Democrats are atheists in America right now. You know what the actual number is? Less than ten percent. Um, you ask Democrats what percentage of Republicans are rich. They say it's like 50%. It's really like 5%, depending on how you define rich. So when you don't know anyone of the other party, you create like the worst version of that in your head and then dislike that version of it. Um, it's so weird when you have a conversation with someone and they go, you seem so reasonable though. <laughs> Because they have no concept that someone on the other side of the aisle, like there are Democrats who don't love the idea of abortion, let's say, and are not really on board with using the term birthing person instead of woman. You know, that blows their mind that there's, there, there's moderate Democrats. And on the other side, there's moderate Republicans because if you look at my mentions on the social media, you'll see that Republicans are racist, fascist, misogynists, are taking this country straight to hell in a different way. And I think... If you look attitudinally, what you're seeing a lot of is we create these caricatures of the other side. It, it, it's good to be in mixed company, guys. I know that's a really controversial thing to say. And church used to be largely mixed company. Um, I'll give you one quick answer, then I'll hand it off. Um, I just finished a book by Rockefeller. Rockefeller loved to go. John D. Rockefeller was an American Baptist like I am, which, you know, obviously, right? Um, he, he, the only social event he went to during a week was church. He went to the Euclid Ave Avenue Baptist Church in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and they asked him why. He said, it's my only chance to talk to the bakers and the blacksmiths and the carpenters. He wanted to have a real conversation with people who are not wearing suits and ties, you know, to work every day. I think we miss that. And when we miss that, we create these weird caricatures and archetypes, and that's what's making us hate each other. We don't hate the real person. We hate the imagined version of the person because they're not real. So... Uh, 
Uh, so regarding your question about how pervasive the prosperity gospel is in the black church, I think it's, I think it's permeated, you know, I would say at least 70% of the church. Mm. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's something that's not necessarily new. And I, a lot of people try to say, oh, it's a new kind of invasion. It, but the idea of a God who's actively involved, who actively rewards people, um, that if you do right, you, you receive it. I think these things have been, have been there, but you do see elements of it quite a bit. Um, so, uh, like, this is your season, plant your seed. Like, a lot of the rhetoric becomes, uh, becomes a part of this. Uh, the idea that um, tithing is, is a way uh, to get more rewards from God. Uh, like, if you tithe, the, you know, the rewards will overflow. Um, so that, I think, is something that's, that's been there for a while. And it's, um, you won't hear people, like the example I gave with the pastor I, I heard, you don't hear people go that far. But you do hear the other aspects of it uh, quite a bit. To what extent is this different than the traditional Protestant ethic? The, you know, the, uh, it, what other elements are there besides that uh, notion you work hard, you keep your nose clean, you know, you, you're going to advance? Um, is there something distinctive about the black co- uh, context? Yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit different because it's also, uh, there's the nature of like if you work hard, you know, if you do what you're supposed to do, everything, everything will work out. But this one is, if you do what you're supposed to do, you'll become rich. Like you will be, oh, you, you will have everything. And so uh, also it's telling people to take risk. You need to step out on your faith. And so in many ways it's good. It's saying, yeah, have some, have some goals. But the problem is, you, so I guess a great example of this is, Time magazine had an article like, did, did God cause the uh, mortgage crash? And it was basically saying the prosperity gospel was behind this because people were going out taking loans they couldn't get. And, you know, one woman was talking about the fact that, you know, her house was about to be foreclosed upon. But she prayed and prayed and prayed. And the bank said, you know what, let's see if we can work something out. It's like, God delivered me. And it's like, well, I could just say the bank realized either getting something from you is better than getting nothing from you. But, it, but the idea is that um, that you step out, you go out, you buy that house you can't afford, and God will make a way. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a little bit different from the, than the classic Protestant work ethic, where it's like you work your way towards that, but this one is, you know, step out on your faith, mm-hmm. and if you, and questioning your faith is, is a sin, and mm-hmm. saying, you know, worrying, things like that. Is bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Emma. Can I actually pose a follow-up question to Eric? Um, so I was reflecting during your talk on the way that the prosperity gospel is often treated in the popular press and by scholars. And I would say, and I wonder if you'd agree with this, it's usually with derision. You know, there are great stories like the Creflo Dollar stories or, you know, people love punching at Joel Osteen. And, you know, it's, I think, easy to draw a certain caricature of these money-hungry, charismatic pastors who are manipulating people. And I'm so interested in um, scholarship that tries to engage with what it is that some of these prosperity or prosperity flavored communities offer, and particularly to black people or communities of color, what is it that's the appeal and the draw? And I wanna specifically sharpen that question by asking, um, you know, you posed at the end of your, your presentation that the prosperity gospel doesn't necessarily have a good account of persistent racism. And I wonder if there's an appeal in a story about the condition of life that black people find themselves in that is different from a story of structural racism or different from you know, the structural critique that a social gospel or a different kind of politics might offer. So um, I challenge you to give the, the upside of the prosperity gospel. Uh, so there's a book by Kate Bowler called Blessed and that's received a lot of attention. She's a sociologist who kind of embedded herself in the congregation and talked about the rise of the prosperity gospel. Uh, there are some others that have kind of talked about it. Uh, if you think about the success of T.D. Jakes and what he's been able to do there, and, and a lot of people have said, like, look, we're, we're aspirational, that the social gospel is a little too doom and gloom, that we need people to have some hope, know that they, you know, that they can achieve these things. Um, now, someone like Creflo Dollar could be a little bit clumsy in the wording that's used. Um, then you have individuals like Eddie Long, in, in a, um, the pastor of New Birth, who passed away, I want to say, uh, maybe about seven years ago, um, uh, who was a highly controversial figure. Uh, and the reason why I transitioned to Eddie Long is that he has been seen as one of those individuals where people talk about the, the disastrous effects of the prosperity gospel on black politics. 
uh, where he told a group of civil rights, you know, people who participate in the civil rights movement, they need to forget racism. You have Creflo Dollar saying, you know, you need to pray, and that's how racism will go away. Uh, and so individuals like this have led Eddie Glau to write a piece saying the black church is dead and that, this, that these things are going on. Um, and I think one of the problems, and this is something that a lot of people talk about, is what happens when, you know, with, with George Floyd? How does the prosperity gospel explain that? How do you explain Trayvon Martin? How do you explain these things happening over and over and over again? And I think that's where it, it, it does run into problems. And also, how does the prosperity gospel deal with uh, aspects of racism within the community? So Fred Price was someone who was very big on it, um, but there was one leader who was telling a story about how his daughter was playing with a, another black girl. He said, oh, yeah, you can play together, but you can't marry each other. And that this led Fred, Fred Price said, no, we need to talk about racism within the church. So you are seeing some of them kind of grapple with that. And I think it's a, um, and I think in many ways, it's, you can think about this with some of the things you've seen in the past of, of that, that God will, that we will fight to overcome racism and God is on our side because we are righteous. We are doing the right thing. And this is, this is the rhetoric you hear of King, uh, you know, it, this is the rhetoric that, no, we, that, you know, we are on God's side, so our faith in God and these actions, so that might be how the prosperity gospel might infuse the two. But, the, but some of the examples you run into with some of the very high-profile folks is they, it's very individualized. It's, um, they're treating a problem as if it's one as opposed to something structural, and that failure to kind of talk about structural problems, to blame poverty on being sinful, uh, as opposed to other things that are going on, undercuts a lot of the key things um, that are part of, which, which is seen as traditionally part of the black political agenda. I'd like to get Molly in here and ask her a question. Uh, can, at, can I, there's so sure, much on the table. Ahead. May I respond? Sure, go ahead. Well, and I want to pick up on uh, your question to Eric a few moments ago about the relationship between the, the Protestant work ethic and Max Weber's reflections on the Puritans and the mm -hmm. prosperity gospel. It's, it's an important question, and what it, what it highlights is that in any of these movements in Christian history that the, the mainstream uh, establishment deems heretical for one reason or another are never cases of uh, a totally alien idea invading the bloodstream of Christianity from the outside with no relationship to, to scripture or doctrinal tradition. They are always cases of the, the delicate web of paradoxes and tensions in Christianity being tipped a little too far out of whack, right? So the basic idea that God rewards his people, that God rewards righteousness, the, the Bible, especially the, the Hebrew Bible, is full of this. So it's a, part of its appeal is that there's a, there's a nuanced version of it that is absolutely biblical, right? The problem comes when it is emphasized to the exclusion of the other countervailing themes in scripture. And the same would be true of highly exaggerated versions of the social gospel. I mean, Eric had to condense two incredibly complicated subcultures into a paragraph, so you could, but you know, so, so the social gospel encompasses a, a, a spectrum, but there is a version of it that you know, really kind of mythologizes the miraculous and, and sees the story of Jesus as purely a story about, about ethics and, and, uh, and one kind of earning, earning salvation by doing God's, God's work and, and, and really denies the sense of, of individual sin. So, so I think that's important to remember. I have a question so for both of you, for, for I guess all of us, about, um, about sorting because it seems to me that, that both the presentations were about sorting and about the relationship between some of these religious dynamics and politics. Ryan, I, I'm struck by uh, the way in which you, you lay out these, these really striking uh, correlations between factors I would consider mostly socioeconomic. And then at the end of your talk, you, shift, you shifted to political, po political sorting, which is, which is actually not the same thing. And so I'm wondering if you could reflect a bit. I mean, I know I've read some data on, you know, uh, voters who supported uh, Donald Trump being kind of disproportionately um, without college degrees and, and uh, at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. But the, the socioeconomic makeup of the two parties is really complicated, and it's not a smooth, 
it's not a smooth one-to-one -one, uh, correlation. Also, I'm, I'm wondering about change over time. I was struck by it, the, the main theme I took, and you showed us a lot of data, so I may have missed important nuances, was that this is a, this is a pattern that's really been true since the 70s. So it's not, it didn't seem that it's, it, we've seen a huge uh, spike or, or increase in the degree to which wealthier people uh, are more, and more educated people are more likely to go to church. And the, I mean, this resonates with what I know as a historian. I mean, the, 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 the church has all, churches have always struggled to reach the very poor. That is a theme going back centuries. Because people have to worry about surviving, right? They don't have time to, uh, to do other things with their lives. So I'm wondering if what's changed, to the extent that there is a shift, is that this sort of uh, not poor working class population that in the, you know, up until the 1970s had a relatively secure existence, could work for, you know, a factory with a solid job, have a pension, um, and therefore have the, have the luxury, the sort of existential luxury to, to commit to a religious organization, their existence since the 1970s has become a lot more precarious. And so I'm wondering if that's the change we're seeing. Um, so, but my question's really about, about the relationship between the socioeconomic change and, and, the, and the political sorting. And then I'm, I'm wondering, Eric, if you could say a little bit more about the complex relationship of what conservative and progressive theology and, and, and politics in the black church context looks like in relationship to, say, the Democratic Party platform. Because, I mean, you, you were saying that there's, there's this um, increase at, in, as religiosity goes up, there's an increase in progressive views on social welfare. But that's very different from, say, sexuality, right? So it seems like the correlation, there's, there's more to it than you had time to get into. So, uh, great, great question. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay. So one thing that Donald Trump did between 2016 and 2020, which I think has gone unreported and really not talked about, he held serve with high education highly active folks like he did not lose any in those buckets of like i go to church every week and i have a four-year college degree he did fine with those people he actually brought a ton of people to the republican party who score low on attendance and low on education exact exact though that is his like how he reshaped the republican party like that to me is like the new trump coalition is low attending low education mostly white, but also Latino and black. He did not... See, usually what happens in politics is if you gain some part of the electorate, you lose some part of the electorate. That's how we think about how politics work over time, is that there's an understanding of the parties that like, as one moves to grab more of the electorate, they expose their other flank, and the other party picks that up. That's actually the theory of why the parties have switched places over the last hundred years. Like, you can't say that Lincoln is a Republican. Like, you can't say that because the parties are now in opposite ideological space because over time they've flanked each other. So what Trump has done then is he's brought in a group of voters who used to vote for the Democrats, which are low education, low attendance people. They've become Republicans. So the question is, well, how does Biden win, right? If, the, if Trump picks up this group, yeah, he wins because he wins everyone else. Like, here's what the parties look like now. The Republican Party is 75% white Christians. The Democratic Party is about 35% white Christians. So the Democratic Party has now become the party of non-religious voters. Almost half of Biden voters are non-religious now. But he's also made huge gains in the most, the most uh, politically homogenous religious group in America today. You guys want to guess what it is? The most politically homogenous religious group in America today? Muslims. Over 90% of Muslims voted for Joe Biden in 2020. Now, they're a small group, don't get me wrong, but they are politically... So what's happening is all those smaller groups like Hindus, Muslims, Jews, non-religious um, are shifting the other direction, becoming hardcore Democrats, so you can lose a lot of the low education, low attending uh, white folks, especially to the Trump side, but if you pick up everything on the other side, because guess who's growing in America? It ain't white Christians, okay? So... That's the, when I talk to the Republicans, the problem is you're basing your party off an eroding foundation. White Christianity will not dominate America in 20 or 30 years like it is today. The Democratic Party's problem is this. How do you keep atheists and black Protestants happy at the same time? Right? Like, imagine 
an issue over transgender, right? Imagine an issue over same sex, because there's bills right now floating around that deal with how much religious liberty that I have as a pastor, right? The Equality Act was floating around at one point, which is really consequential for a Catholic church who has a school. Can a Catholic church fire a teacher who comes out as gay or trans? Black Protestants would say, absolutely they can. You know what atheists say? That is discrimination. How do you square that circle if you're the Democrats? Because the atheists are not going to stop talking about it. They are not. Biden stopped talking about it because he realized it was a loser for him as a political issue. These, so the Democrats have huge problems too. The Republican problem is their, their base is eroding. The Democrats' problem is how do you keep this weird menagerie of people <laughs> under the same tent uh, going forward? That's always been the Democrats. It's problem. always been the Democratic problem. And it's not getting any better. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I mean Ryan, you, you kind of set everything up. I think when Obama came out in support of, of same-sex marriage, that you, you did see a, a massive movement on the part of blacks. Um, and I think it was, it was kind of warming up. And it was quite interesting is, you know, Obama said, yeah, I'm against the gay marriage because that's, you know, that's just my religious beliefs. But the church he went to, the pastor was super supportive of it. So it was more like, no, that's, that's a, that you, you were saying that for political reasons, not uh, really religious reasons. I do think the Democratic Party has a very hard time with, with black Protestants. It's, so the Democratic Party has a hard time with black people, period. It, it's the black people are treated as the cannon fodder. It's we want you to come out and vote. We want you to do all this, uh, but when it comes to your issues, we'll do something symbolic. And we'll, we'll put on kente cloth and take a knee in the, in the Capitol building. That, that, that's the extent of what we'll do. Uh, and it, so it comes off as the pandering. And this is part of the reason why you know, Hillary Clinton lost in 2016, is that she could have actually done a lot more to get the black vote out, but it's like, oh, I've got it in the bag. And it was, and, but also her history hurt. Uh, Biden still had a bit of the Obama glow, which, which helped. But I think one of the major things that's going um, to be a problem is as, the, as certain segments of the, of the Democratic Party become more and more, and I wouldn't say this is a large portion of them, but as certain segments become more and more vocal about being anti-religion, they're going to scare blacks away. Uh, and the Democratic Party... And I guess the, the biggest problem I have, as you think about it, is the Republican Party became the party of, of the religious with Reagan, but before you had Jimmy Carter, who was still teaching Sunday school. But how, how do you do this? And the fact that Clinton uses a lot of rhetoric, and I think it's, it's a way of understanding what it means to be religious, that, that differed. But the Democratic Party has to, has to reckon with how its relationship with blacks in general. And this is part of that. This is part of it. I think, in general, the Democratic Party has done a, a relatively better job, but still horrible job. That it's very much of a elitist. Um, we will tell you what to do, uh, and not talking with people of color, but talking at them, which is uh, which is why you will see some of them defect because they think I'm not being heard. We haven't talked about one of the largest. Uh, growing groups in American religious life, and that's Latinos, and Latinos and Protestants and Catholics, uh, they're quite different politically. Uh, Latino Protestants, uh, who are a growing group, are increasingly Republican, uh, and they're among the more, uh, in the last election at least, among the more relig uh, observant Latino Catholics, there is a growing group of Republicans as well. Uh, do Either our qualitative people or our quantitative people have any insight they could offer us on that? So I wrote a piece for Politico where I looked at county-level religion data. So you can look at 2010 versus 2020. And, and the story of, of 2020 was Biden did really bad in certain places, like Miami-Dade County. He did much worse in Miami-Dade County. What's interesting about Miami-Dade County is it became 10% more religious between 2010 and 2020. Uh, if you look at, um, there's counties along the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, like Star County, Maverick County, where it was a 40-point swing between 2016 and 2020 toward the Republicans. If you look at the data, Star County, which is a, it's like 20,000 people a county, but I think it's indicative, 30% more religious in 2020 versus 2010. And you know what it is. It's just, uh, it's, it's um, church records. So they contact denominations and ask them, how many people do you have on your roles? So it's all, it's all membership roles. It's not survey data. 
but 30% more religious. And you know what that is. That's Hispanic Catholics largely. And so it, what, I don't think Texas is going to be a blue state at any point because the Hispanic immigration is not making the state bluer. I actually, actually think it's making it redder in certain parts. And I just don't see that narrative. Florida is a red state now. Okay, let's just put it off. the. It is not, this is not 2,000 and hanging chads anymore, okay? That is not going to happen. And Texas, I think, is, I don't see a future where Texas becomes a toss-up state in the next 20 years because the people coming to Texas. Now, the data also says, though, that if you're a second or third generation immigrant, you assimilate to the religious culture of the, the place you're in, which means that young Latinos look more like their colleagues, which are less religious, that's part of the narrative too. They're not hang, they're not being hardcore third generation Catholics. They're so if forty five percent of their friends are nuns. They're going to be nuns too. You know they're not sticking out with like the old style religion. So I think it's a really complicated story. But I think a big part of the reason that Biden didn't do better in these Hispanic counties is because those religious voters don't do not like democratic social policy on trans, abortion, LGBTQ. That's not what makes them. Want to vote well, for Louis Democrats. Shishera has also, uh, maybe you saw his recent post in the Liberal Patriot, but he argues that on economic questions, mm-hmm. uh, they're also more conservative uh, than the Democratic Party. They're much more individualistic and entrepreneurial and so on as well. So, uh, one question, we've got a, one question from the audience. David. Okay, um, well thank, thank you both for two really interesting and engaging presentations. Um, and I just want to bring them into conversation for a minute, if I can. So um, I, was, um, I was, Dr. Berge, I was really interested in your um, way of describing uh, American Protestantism as, as a luxury good. Uh, and I'm wondering if that rings true for the black experience in the black church. Is, is, is the story he's telling about um, Protestantism in general is, does that ring true for what we see in the black church, or is the black church an outlier? Uh, what was interesting as he was presenting it, there was a research note from well over 20 years ago, uh, 25, 26 years ago, which looked at blacks in church attendance and found that the poor blacks were less likely to attend church. Now, they didn't account for religious importance, things like that, but it does seem to indicate that church attendance, you know, if you think about, at least classically, the way you think about church is you put on a suit, you know, you, you put money in there. Things like, that is something for those who have a, good, a certain amount of money. And so you'd expect the extremely poor to, to, not, to not be able to do that. Um, I know churches have tried to come say, come as you are um, a lot more. So that, that may have changed. Uh, but I think it would, it would be interesting to see what happens if we did break this down to um, black church attenders. Uh, the problem is the sample size for blacks is so small in these surveys that it's hard to really tell. Um, I think there is, some, there is some data coming out that might give us a little more leeway on that, uh, but I think the small sample size prevents us from really being able to break it down as well as we would like. Well, thank you all very much. And um, thank all of you for coming, and especially for those of you who came Two nights in a row, special stars for you. Um, you'll get two CLPs. Oh, no, I guess that's not more. Um, I want to invite you to our next Tocqueville event, which is on October 11th at 5 p.m., when we will hear from economic historian Jerry Z. Muller of Catholic University of America on the topic of Tocqueville on commerce in America. So we're going from religion to gold uh, and trade. So, God, God and mammon. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, join me in thanking our speakers. And you're dismissed. <laughs>